As you know, I have a thesis about the exponential age that we're about to go through the fastest pace of technology the world has ever seen. That's what this whole series is about. This next interview with an old friend of mine is probably one of the most important single interviews you will watch. I can't stress enough how important the concepts and what is happening and the speed of which artificial intelligence is going to change humanity. It is something that we all need to pay attention to, understand and use in our favor because it's happening and it's happening at a scale of which you cannot comprehend. Emma, fantastic to see you back on Real Vision. Good to be back. Thanks for having me. Um, you were known in the past in various guises on Real Vision because this is not your first rodeo. <laughs> you yeah. were the frontier guy. And we're going to talk about <clears throat> a new frontier today. And then also in the pandemic, you helped guide us through some of that too. Give people a bit about your background, because it's a fascinating background and it's an interesting journey to where you are today. Yeah, um, it has been a few different skins. Now, I was a hedge fund manager at the start of my career running global macro, um, then switched to emerging markets, frontier markets and tech. Uh, at one point, I was one of the larger video game investors out there, which is also quite fun. Took a bit of a break when my son was diagnosed with autism, and I used artificial intelligence to repurpose drugs uh, to make him better, while advising some top hedge fund managers and governments on various things, including counter-extremism and <laughs> you know fun things like that. Went back to being a hedge fund manager, did okay, and then, um, yeah, had a look at the world. And, you know, what we do as fund managers is we look for arbitrage opportunities, and we look for where things are building up and breaking down. And it struck me that a lot of stuff was breaking down. And I decided, like, let's try and make it better effectively uh, by combining some of these systems and some of these arbitrage opportunities. So one of the big things was education. Um, another big thing was uh, leading the United Nations AI initiative against COVID-19. I think the last time I was on uh, Real Vision was February the 6th, 2020. And we had a nice chat about how the world was going to change dramatically. And uh, it did. And then I was like, oh, crap, I have to do something about it. So we made all the COVID research in the world free uh, and pushed that. And then I was lead architect of um, Kayak, which was the UNESCO World Bank WHO backed initiative to use artificial intelligence to take all that knowledge and compress it down to reports for policymakers so that we can be a bit more coordinated. Similar to how we take all that information in fund management, compress it down and try to figure out those key drivers. It was a mixed success, but I think it did some difference. And now from that, uh, something a bit bigger, which is AI for everything, basically. So AI has clearly now become your thing, right? This is your focus. Yeah. So before we get into what you're doing now, what the hell gave a hedge fund manager the thought process that, hey, I can help the WHO and everybody else with artificial intelligence? Well, it's because to be a hedge fund manager, you have to be a bit of an egomaniac, right? You have to believe that you're right and everyone else is kind of wrong. Look, I mean, uh, all of what we do is information classification, and that's the nature of artificial intelligence. So information comes in, and then Claude Shannon style information theory. Information is only valuable in as much as it changes in state. So you're always looking for something on that graph or that news thing that will cause you to change from a buy to a sell or an increase or decrease in your positioning, right? I kind of realized over the years, though, like my background was mathematics, computer science originally, and so quite quantitative, quite analytical, that... The next wave of AI was something a bit different that would enable us to do something a bit different. Because we moved from this big data age, you know, where you had massive amounts of information and they extrapolated it and targeted it to kind of sell Raoul some suntan or whatever, you know, to something a bit different, a big model. You're jealous of my tan. Whereby you're jealous of my tan. I'm jealous of your tan. <laughs> I'm in London, you're in Cayman Islands, I'm turning pasty. <laughs> Completely. Uh, I have to fly, fly out there soon. So you moved from that area was about extrapolation in the individual to something new in 2017, which was a big model age. AI went from being able to just do extrapolation to being able to pay attention. In fact, there was a seminal paper called Attention is All You Need about how to build an AI that paid attention to the most important parts of a sentence, the most important parts of an image, to do principle-based analysis, which is insane if you think about it. But it's exactly what we do, right? We have this heuristic. What do you, what do you mean by principle-based analysis? Sorry. So rather than doing extrapolation, so rather than doing momentum, beta, AI became able to do alpha. 
it became able to basically come up with principles that allowed it to understand the hidden layers of meaning with things. So we can go that into a bit more detail. But this is how the human brain works, right? We have two parts of our brain. The future is like the past, and that's a tiger over there in that bush, right? It's the type one, type two kind of thinking. So AI was always one of the extrapolation. And now we have a new type of AI that mimics the human brain by figuring out principles from highly structured data, which is kind of what we did every single day as the finance guys, right? But at a completely different scale. I don't think even now people have appreciated how big a change that's going to be to just about everything. I think we're starting to figure that out now. So before we get into the guts of this, let's go on a bit of the journey of AI, because you've talked about where it was, and then we started to see stuff like DeepMind, and then GPT-3, OpenAI, all of this. So if you can just frame it for people, because a lot of this is going to be new for people, and I think it's incredibly important people understand what's happening, the speed at which it's happening, where the hell of this is going. Yeah, so if you look at DeepMind, um, they are famous for many things. You know, Demis has done a fantastic job. Um, one of the things they did is, thinking back, you had Gary Kasparov being beaten by Deep Blue. So, you know, us, us older fellows, we remember that. Not like the young whippersnappers who've never seen a bear market in their lives. Uh, <laughs> you know, kind of changes happening. What Deep Blue did was it did an analysis of every single game in the past and then extrapolated it and then it brute forced it. So Gary could only think X moves in the future. It could think X plus two, X plus three. And that's how he got beaten by brute force. Now, the Chinese game of Go, Chinese checkers effectively, People thought you'd never be able to brute force it because there's too many things that you can do. There's too many moves on that board, right? Um, and so they're like, ah, that'll never be beaten by a computer because you need to build a computer that's the biggest computer ever times a million. What DeepMind did is that basically they came up with a self-supervised learning algorithm that learned how to dream. <laughs> that's probably the best way to kind of put it, about how one would play Go in a principled way. So it didn't even have all the past games in its memory. It just played against itself and tried to figure out how to do this. They made a whole base of these agents with reinforcement learning that you gave it an Atari with no instructions that learned how to play Breakout and then StarCraft right. and all sorts Without of Without any instructions. I mean, people need to understand that. It figured it out. You put it, the computer in front of something, it just figures it out and then gets better and better. So when you see it playing Breakout, it's suddenly doing these crazy moves like that. And so Lisa Doll was like, I think, a seventh Dan in uh, Go. So he was a Magnus Carlsen of kind of Go, effectively. And it wasn't a current Magnus Carlsen type situation. It's very difficult to cheat in Go because you didn't have computers to help you, right? <laughs> We're not talking about anal probes in this one. We're talking about... <laughs> uh, yeah. Conversations go in funny ways, right? So what happened is that uh, the next highest person was like a fourth Dan or something. So he's like... Federer, Carlson rolled into one that much better. I was like, never beat him. He won one game, the computer won seven. And everyone was like, holy crap, what is that? Because computer learned to play in a completely different way. And it was like, this is playing with an alien. Yeah, because it because... didn't learn past games. It, As you said, it, it learns in an entirely new way. Literally, it played against itself. It dreamt. So then it plays against itself in its memory. And then it does that again and again and again. And so within just a few weeks, it outperformed him. And then these models got better and better and smaller and smaller. We haven't seen the generalization of the models yet, but they're coming. These agents that can basically optimize when you don't even tell it the rules, which is kind of insane. Then on the other hand, you had what was known as um, foundation models, which is where this attention-based architecture came in. So in the attention thing, they were seeing where the games are. I should actually add a final thing about this, and you can see this in the AlphaGo documentary. That's on YouTube if you want to see more details is that as a result of this, did Lisa Doll go and say, I'm hanging up my Go pieces and I'm going to pack them away? No. He started playing against it, and now he's even better as a player. And the entire Go competitive scene has improved because now they're figuring out brand new ways and kind of gambits and things they'd never seen before, which I think is really interesting. Then you had kind of this other kind of big area, which was kind of some of this deep learning area. We have these big corpuses, and, you know, like I said, you can do extrapolations and stuff, but you don't understand meaning. And so this is where these attention-based architectures came in. Um, it's actually quite interesting. So when I was taking a break from fund management to work with my son, 
Um, autism is a very interesting condition. No cure, nothing to be done. So, of course, you know, you go and quit being a hedge fund manager and build a team and try to do it because egomaniacs, right? You My wife is a applied behavioral analyst who just treats kids with, kids with autism. So I live it, that life. Exactly. So applied behavioral analysis uses variable rewards and a lot of the stuff you use in video games to rebuild words. So if you have a stroke or you have autism, you haven't basically said can, right? So the word can can mean I can, it can mean that can, it can mean the can can, lots of different things. But because there's so much noise in the brain, which is why you see a lot of kids and adults with autism not being able to handle large amounts of information. I have Asperger's myself and ADHD. They usually balance out, sometimes not quite. Um, <laughs> it's very difficult to pay attention. And we all feel that. Like, you know, when your leg is tapping, there's just too much going on. That's the fugue state because there's two transmitters in the brain, GABA, which calms you down, and glutamate, which excites you. So when you pop a Valium, your GABA levels go up. And imagine if your brain was always excited for one reason or another. You wouldn't be able to concentrate and build those connections to the word can. You know, that hidden layer of meaning for what can is. Um, so, you know, that's why I repurpose drugs to adjust those levels. There's like 16 different things we identify that could potentially cause it. But because medicine treats everyone the same, it meant that one drug that made 34% of kids better made 28% of kids worse, so there's no cure and there's no treatment. So that's a different, bigger story and something, again, this AI can help with. And why is that relevant? It's because what this AI does now is exactly the same. It uses giant honking supercomputers so that if you take a terabyte of text, it learns what the most important words of the sentence are, and that's what GPT-3 was from OpenAI. It took a 1,000 gigabytes of text, and it learned how to write in any style and any extension. So it paid the most important part of any sentence. So you give it a sentence like Legolas and Gimli. That's all you give it, and it will write an entire scene in the style of Tolkien that's never been seen before. You know, you give it a sentence and you say, make it happier. It understands what happier is. And this is what's called a latent space of meaning because it takes, uh, that took uh, one terabyte of information, so a thousand gigabytes. And GPT-3 is about 40 gigabytes in size. But it can recreate any style of writing and it can understand any style of writing, which is, I mean again, a bit crazy. I mean, it's it's staggering. We'll, we'll come into the societal impacts and what this all means in a bit, but just want yeah. to get through the technology. It is astonishing when you see GPT-3 because basically it writes authentic pieces that are not stolen from other things, much like the Deep um, deep Mind did with Go. It wasn't stealing from old games. It learned how to do it. Is that right? It learned. It learned principles, it learned stars, it learned what's called a latent space, the hidden layers of meanings between different types of words. So like, um, we just released the most advanced image version of that, Stable Diffusion. Stable Diffusion took 100,000 gigabytes, so 100 terabytes of images, and we made a two gigabyte file that can do any style and any image of any type. So that this is like Dali, right? What's it's the Dalion steroids. Hi, I'm Raoul Pal, the CEO and co-founder of Real Vision. The financial world is a complicated world right now. It's a really complicated macro picture, and there's a lot of risks. Real Vision and our YouTube channel help you navigate those risks. So subscribe now to the channel and never miss an update. There is simply too much going on. So subscribe now. Thank you. So... So explain Dali, and then we'll come into what you're doing, because, you know, again, I just want to get people up the knowledge graph, because Dali was the next big one that I stopped in my tracks and went, holy shit, this is amazing. Yeah, so so GPT-3 came out in 2020, and then we released the open source version of that GPT Neo, which I'll come back to. Last year, there was a breakthrough in image generation. So you can generate text, and everyone was like, image is too difficult, right? Because a picture paints a thousand words. Like, surely it should be a thousand times more complex. Nice. Turns out it wasn't. Nice. Yeah. So you had um, something called Clip, which basically you took any image and it'd be able to classify it. So it'd be able to say, that's a Raul and that's a Red Sofa and all these things. It understands loads of concepts because they compress that down. Then you had a generative model that took words to images. So you had two models, a word to image model and image to word model. And at the start of last year, we figured out how to bounce them off each other. So to generate an image... And then it'd check if that image was the same as the prompt, and it'd go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And after 10 minutes, you generate a simulacrum of an image from the word input. So words go in, images come out. And we're like, holy crap. It looks a bit mushy, 
but that's insane. It can generate an image of anything, but it isn't high quality. Then what happened is that OpenAI and us accelerated that whole space because we thought it was freaking cool and put lots of research into it. And so you've got to the point now whereby you can put in Robert De Niro as Gandalf and one second later, you get an image output. So the first output of that was uh, that hit the mainstream was Dali from OpenAI. That was in April of this year. So you can say a cyber goth girl overlooking near Tokyo, and boom, eight seconds later, it's generated. And this is a totally yeah. unique creative image that did not exist in the world before, right? It did not exist in the world before. All the data that went into that, so it was about 600 million images, it can't recreate any of those images. Instead, it's learned the principles of that. So again, it's the principle-based analysis, which is insane, right? Um, because it's like, again, it's the heuristic stuff that we do all the time. And it can combine different concepts. So you can say a Van Gogh by Banksy, and it will do a Van Gogh by Banksy, or kind of do Scream. And now there's more and more technologies that have emerged from that. So OpenAI kind of uh, announced the closed beta of that. And then my company, Stability AI, created a version that was 30 times faster and more powerful. So tell me about Stability AI. When did it start? Who's involved? What are you guys doing? Yeah, so it started in 2020. Um, well, technically started in 2019 with the education work, but I can talk about that later. But 2020 is when it was formed officially to do the COVID work. So it's lead the UN COVID initiative, launched at Stanford, etc. So you founded um, this? So that, I founded it, yeah. Nice. Because someone needed to build something to do AI as a public good. So I didn't exactly know what the business model was or anything like that then. I just thought, someone needs to build this stuff because people are dying, effectively. And then we had the other project. So actually, I'll mention it. So my co-founder and I, so Joe's uh, runs the charitable arm, we have took the Global X Prize for Learning. So that was a $15 million prize funded by Elon Musk and Tony Robbins for the first app that could teach literacy and numeracy in 18 months without internet. And we've been deploying it in refugee camps and low-income areas around the world to the point where now we are teaching kids literacy and numeracy in 13 months and one hour a day in a refugee camp in Malawi. And we just got the remit to educate every child in Malawi, 3.9 million kids, with a completely open book of hardware, software, deployment, and curriculum. So we're going to invite the world to say, let's build an open source education system where the AI teaches the kids and the kids teach the AI. That's the type of stuff that we wanted to do because so much of the world's issues are coordination problems. So I figured out how to bring in the multilaterals, the locals, and others, like some cool mechanism design. I said, let's do education, let's do healthcare. But then as we were doing this, and we talked to a lot of the big private companies, they promised a lot, and they didn't deliver. And this got me thinking about the future. So some of the people on this call will be familiar with um, the Chinese social credit score system and the use of AI in China to identify Ugias and others, and everyone's got a rating. You hang out with someone with too low a rating, your rating starts to go down. Eight million people in China can't it's, use planes or trains. It's behavioral economics, right, done by AI. It's gamified life. Life has become a video game. That's right. You know? And AI is the extra suits on top. But now you think about it, the entire Web 2, as it might were, was basically Facebook and Google. It was AI. Big data models. And now you've moved to the big model era, where to build these models, you need to have the best data, amazingly smart people, and freaking supercomputers. By freaking supercomputers, I mean like supercomputers that are multiple times faster than NASA's supercomputers, because that's what compresses this data down into knowledge. So information to knowledge almost, because knowledge is when you extract the principles from information, right? And then wisdom is when you apply it to today. So we have this sudden knowledge extraction system. So I looked at that and I was like, the only people that can build this are NVIDIA, Meta, Google, slash DeepMind, Microsoft, slash open AI. And how are they aligned? What does it look like? Because this is super powerful technology that can be used to target us ads better than anything else. Or it can be used to change our mind because it's convincing. You see GPT-3 writing. You can't tell it's not a human. Right? You look at the audio versions. You can't listen and say it's not a human. Like my sister-in-law, Zena, just sold her company to Spotify. It's an antic. Fully emotionally real AI voices using this technology. So she did the technology for all of Blizzard and everything. I've just seen somebody has now got AI for creating podcasts. So you can have J Joe yeah. Rogan interviewing Steve Jobs. Neither of these exist, and the interview never existed, but the AI does it. And it sounds just like them, right? 
And this is the thing, it's got to that human level. So like um, Sonantic also did Val Kilmer's voice for his documentary in Top Gun because he lost it completely. And it's completely emotionally real. So it's getting to that period of emotional realness and human realness, which means then you think about the future and you're like, this is one of the most powerful technologies ever because it's approaching humanity. Not in a generalized sense where the AI can do everything in its Skynet, but as a tool for targeting and convincing and manipulation. So what happens if only big tech companies do this? Because they went from being open to being private. Even OpenAI, that got a billion dollars from Musk and others, and then a billion from Microsoft, stopped releasing their code because said it was too dangerous for people to have this. You know, So they turned closed, and then they stopped sharing. And you're like, as this is the most powerful thing, if you fast forward five, 10 years, does it make sense that a private company will have a monopoly or a series of private companies will have a monopoly on this? Then it will reflect basically Palo Alto norms. And it will mean those companies are more powerful than any government in Earth. And I was like, that's wrong. I was like, there needs to be an alternative that is open. You know, kind of AI for the people, by the people, we call it. Um, because not only is that morally right, because it's unethical to keep powerful technology that can make people's lives better from the people that could benefit from it the most, but it's actually a better model. Because you have open innovation. This is why Linux became the servers of choice and the most secure servers. Windows has all these holes in, Linux holes get patched instantly, right? This is where you've got databases kind of taking over because nothing can beat human creativity when that happened. I look at Web3 and crypto and I'm like, it nearly got there and then it kind of got hijacked because it was part of the puzzle, but it wasn't the whole puzzle. Because when I went to talk to a lot of Web3 people, I'm like, where's the AI in Web3? They were like, well, we'll get to it. But I was like, the whole of Web2 was AI. How are you going to do Web3 without AI? And when they gave examples like Alethia and other things, um, you know, with the talking NFTs, the technology they used was our technology that we released, that used GPT Neo, um, which I thought was quite interesting. So then I realized there's actually a bigger thing here and a bigger reason to do this. But how do you compete with OpenAI and DeepMind and Microsoft and Google with their billions of dollars of budget? Uh, which was an interesting one. Like, how do you do it, right? Do you go and raise $2 billion? No. Go do it another way. So what did you do? This is fascinating. I built community. Fascinating. So I built community. So in 2020, a lot of people were just like, you know, COVIDed and uh, in quarantine. So we built up a Luther AI, which the base principle was, let's create an open source version of GPT-3. You know, where it's like... Uh, did you create it or did you... Cl- did you create it or clone GPT-3 and then allowed to build on top? How, how do you start this? Oh, so, so like there were five initial creators, and then I came like a month after, along with some of the second wave, and said, let's accelerate this up. So they looked at the model. So the data wasn't open, so we had to create our own data set. And so we had to crawl the internet and create a terabyte of data. The compute wasn't available, so we got a grant from Google, uh, who provided the compute initially. And then the expertise... It was all like PhD students or self-taught programmers and others were like, how would this work? Because they released an academic paper, but they didn't give any code. So we built the code from scratch and then created a model that was 75% as good, but it was available. So the models from Eleuther AI, which uh, kind of stability runs now basically via the uh, top level people, um, but we're going to spin it off into its own independent charity for a number of reasons. Um... They've been downloaded 25 million times now by developers. So anytime you see a chatbot or something like that that's getting to human levels, it's probably going to be that. And it was just released open source to the world. It's 80% as good as GPT-3, but it doesn't matter because you can customize it and you can extend it and you can run it on your own hardware. So it's a 20 billion parameter model versus 175 billion parameter model. It's eight times smaller. But, you know, it's just like the big steel mills and the little ones, if you look at the kind of Clayton Christensen thing. Small can outcompete big. Um, and then I realized that there's a talent arbitrage here whereby there's a lot of people that want to build open source, but there's no supercompute in academia. So when I said supercomputes needed for this, I meant it. Like um, the amount of supercompute, the amount of breakthroughs in this foundational model research, 20 years ago, 100% came from academia. 10 years ago, 75% came from academia. Last year, 0% came from academia because there was this massive ramp up in compute capabilities, but academia couldn't access it, only private companies could. So if you wanted to have a breakthrough or work in cutting edge research, you had three options, do a startup, startup suck. 
So let's put that to the side, especially for academics, right? Number two, you go and work for big tech, and then you get 59-page NDAs. And you might do cool stuff, like we've seen text-to-video from the Google team. That'll never be released by Google because of ethical fears, which we can discuss. And the final option is that, you know, you go and work for some of these independent labs like OpenAI and others that were meant to be independent and then became less independent over time. But otherwise, you stay in academia and you're like, I would like to do these, but I can't. So I saw that the core um, choke point was compute. A community was forming for talent. And then we need to be highly structured about data. So what I did was I said, how big a supercomputer can I build if I put all my money into it? And I become very persuasive. And then I built the 10th fastest public supercomputer in the world in uh, four months. And it turns out you can build a very large supercomputer. So uh, Ezra 1, which is our supercomputer, which all my money went into, is uh, about eight times faster than the fastest supercomputer in the UK and about seven times faster than all of NASA's supercomputers put together. And that's the level that you need to basically create these models. It's like the entry level. Um, that need for compute keeps going up. Can you use distributed computing power, or is it still not fast enough? So so you can do it once you've done the initial model. So what happens is that you take, in this case, we took 100,000 gigabytes of data. So we made the biggest image data set in the world. Previously, the largest was 100 million, then we made 400 million, then we made... 5.6 5.6 billion, a 250 terabyte image label pair data set. Then we took 2 billion of that, which is the high quality images, and then we crunched them back and forth on this. So what happens is after you crunch them back and forth, then you've got a file that can be adapted and trained. It's like, basically, it's gone through primary school of learning. <laughs> and then you can teach it more advanced concepts. So like some people are taking it and training on Japanese concepts. Some people are taking it and training on anime cat girl waifus or whatever, you know? You can add that specialization once it's achieved kind of the high school level. So there's a big compute and then little compute. Does the network then learn from all of these people working on the network itself? So I... No. You've got... Because you're distributed and you've got lots of people doing different things, does that increase the knowledge base or not? It increases the knowledge base of the community, but we have to understand this model. It's not a distributed model where it's like lots of little brain cells out there. It's a two gigabyte file that can recreate and create any image in any style. So you took 100,000 gigabytes from it and created two. So sometimes I think I'm on that Silicon Valley show, you know, uh, from HBO, and we're Pied Piper, and I think, crap, am I Ehrlich Bachman or Ross Hanneman? You know, like, (laughs) where's my role in here? It's one of those kind of guys, right? Um, It's the most advanced technology the world's ever seen for compression because the entirety of Humanity is basically about communication and compression, right? We're compression machines. That's all we do. So people are listening to this podcast now, and they're literally listening to yours and mine, common context and the compression of all the knowledge that we've had over the years. And they're learning something new right now. It's what we do. And hopefully it's valuable because they'll see that, holy crap, this new technology wave is coming. But if you can do it to images, you can do it to anything. So actually how we had the breakthrough is we took a language model and an image model and we used them together. And somehow it learned the different concepts. Then what we're seeing is that when you have different models of different types, so someone takes a two gigabyte file, you take it and you put it on all your images in, and I take it and I put all my images in, we can actually fuse them together and create another two gigabyte file that knows both of them without going up in size very much. That's a bit insane. In fact, OpenAI did this with a model called Gatto recently. So what happened is that there were hundreds of different models they built that were quite big that were like robotics and playing chess and all these other things. They said, what happens if we combine them all together and see what happens to these latent spaces, the hidden meanings of understanding, just like the neurons in our brain? They created a 1.6 billion parameter file that can open doors and play chess and play StarCraft and all sorts of other things. And they were like, what? And this is the thing, like you've got a breakthrough in intelligence But then you've broken through to the point where, this is the important part, stable diffusion is the first model that's small enough, fast enough, and cheap enough to go anywhere. So you can run it on your MacBook M1. So you can make Robert De Niro, Bob Banksy, and Renoir in Guadalajara in a snowstorm without internet access. And that two gigabyte file will reproduce that faithfully each time. Without internet access? Yes. It is a two gigabyte file that has compressed the knowledge of the internet in images. 
oh, I, can't, I can't quite get my head yeah. around this. So where do you think what you're working on goes? What is the image thing? Where is this going towards? Because right now, it's kind of interesting. Yes, we're going to see creative industries, marketing, others use this quite yeah. quickly and effectively. But where is this re- in your head? Where's your mental model? What you're actually working on here? Because you're not working on in- creating nice images. You're working on something bigger. What is that? It's the intelligent internet. Intelligence is about to be pushed out to the edge. So every person, country, country, and culture has their own models that are constantly updated. So you'll have your own model of all your knowledge across modalities, and you can run it on your local hardware without being access to the internet. So the internet right now is centralized, and all is running on Google servers and guiding you. That gets pushed out to the edge. Because finally, you have this compression technology. And you know it's interesting because there's a bunch of structural things here. So Apple is the most interesting thing with regards to this. Apple will be the biggest AI company in the world in two years. Why? I'm listening to this on a MacBook M1 right now. 16.8% of the chipset is a neural engine that's not used. That is designed for exactly this type of model. And it's proliferating, right? Everyone's moving to M1 MacBooks. Everyone's moving to A16 Bionics that also have neural engines. And they're not used. Are Apple stupid? No. They have an entire team building these types of models for their augmented reality and beyond. So you're going to move from Siri 1 to Siri 5. The Siri's a bit crap. It won't be seen. And so as that technology proliferates, and then people take what we're building, and you create 100,000, a million new developers in this space, the possibilities are endless. You've seen hundreds of things built on stable diffusion. But like I said, I don't just want images. I want audio. I want video. I want to have text. I want knowledge. I want my databases combined with this. I want my type 1 and type 2 brains. And then you have an AI that either manipulates you or it works for you. And my thing is, it's open infrastructure that should work for every individual. And this is also why I've got a very different approach to most. So most people's approach would be B2B, go to the big companies and sell them API access. Instead, I'm forward deploying engineers into the biggest brands in the world, getting them to invest in my next round of financing. And I'm also doing that for countries. I'm going to India and saying, what's the probability this technology will be used by everyone in India in 10 to 20 years? 100% or 95%. So I'm saying, I'll build it for you next year and getting all the biggest Indian conglomerates and others together and taking the smartest engineers out of Silicon Valley back to India. Like uh, one of my fun ones is I have a JV with Eros, which is the Netflix of India. So 200 million daily active users, all the Bollywood content, I have an exclusive on it and a revenue share. So what's the probability that Bollywood content will be interactive through these models? Of course it will be. So I'm locking Netflix down all the content. Netflix already on interactive content, actually. Yeah, but not like this. They don't have this expertise because right now, you know how many people can build these models? 40. In five years, how many people will be able to build these models? 4 million. So there's some really interesting arbitrages in the market right now. And my take is that if I push hard enough and I outcompete the big guys, which I am, like my team's 100 now, um, you know, and I'm outcompeting these big guys by building markets, products, markets, uh, products to the market quicker, then I force everyone to go open source because it's no longer a differentiating factor. And then that changes it from a closed panopticon for our kids, you know, and ourselves to something different. I'm not sure what it is, but I think it's more beneficial. Okay, so let's talk about what it could be. It's clearly fucking terrifying because either open source or in private hands, if it's open source, it's like a virus it'll go where it goes and people will use it how they use it and there's no stopping it okay fine how does society deal with the fact that we don't know who is who is a human and who is not and how we're being manipulated and who not i wrote a thread on this the other day about digital id being one of these key things but it's this whole element of deep fake of what what is real in this world how do you deal with this? Because it's going to shatter society. It will adjust society, definitely. <laughs> and so part of my reason for releasing the model, uh, you know, during the COVID thing, I just had a lot of conversations about herd immunity, right? <laughs> Which was bad for that. I believe it's good for this. Releasing this model out there, it's going to be everywhere in a year. This is, the, this is a one to one billion person moment, right? 
Yeah, right yeah, now, like, a few million people. This is exponential. Using it. This is exponential without question. It's exponential without question. But this is a really interesting thing. Right now, very few people know that you can create anything in a second for one cent and less than a cent soon, right? Soon everyone will know about it because it'll be in all your favorite apps. So we're integrated into Canva right now. We're integrated into Photoshop. You can see big announcements coming out because we're partnering with everyone with interactive content. What does that mean? It means people suddenly start thinking about this thing. What is real? What is not real? And I said identity is key. So the other part of Apple, and that's bullish on Apple, is the fact that they've got the identity architecture down. And that allows them to have verified content creation. So one of the things we have with Adobe and others is uh, we've been pushing uh, content authority, basically, which is a small metadata file that attaches to every piece of content and it's hash. And if either of them are edited, it changes and it shows that it's not true. It's not a blockchain thing, but it allows you to verify content in a positive way. Like it, why is it not on blockchain? Attached to or not. It's not on blockchain because it doesn't need to be on blockchain. That's why. Well, because the centralization of of the knowledge, right? Because like Google owns all of the knowledge. Blockchain is the only way of not having one central power owning the knowledge. It's a. Uh... It is a way of not having one central power owning the knowledge, and you can combine this with a blockchain. But you can think of it as super advanced metadata. Yeah. So you know when you have metadata in a file, like EXIF, when you edit that, the file stays constant. Did this, they're both immutable, effectively. So you can tell if one or the other has been tampered. So if it says that it's from Raoul, it's from Raoul, effectively. But there's no blockchain lookup for that. You can make it stronger with a blockchain, but you know it's just a standard that's open source that we're pushing, effectively. So it's kind of a positive one. It's not a negative one. Obviously, there's ways around that and things like that. But it'll get people thinking about these things. How does identity work in a new age? Because so much of what we do is identity, right? Most of finance is basically securitization, which is identity. Um, most of kind of and the whole of blockchain is identity. It's all about identity exchange. So the thing is, how can we build better systems for identity? Because that's the final part. Information, this massive information. And also, Stable Diffusion, as we released it, was a snapshot of the internet. It's biased, it's racist, it's everything, if you enter the prompts in wrong. Part of that yeah, I remember was like, you showing some of the images of the racial bias of the algorithms. So my thing was like, if it's just one company that controls it, like what OpenAI did with DALI. So DALI is a control system. You don't access the code images or anything. To make it less racist, whenever a gender-neutral word is put, like sumo wrestler, it would randomly add a gender and a race. So you typed in sumo wrestler and you got Indian female sumo wrestler, tiny little Indian lady, sumo wrestling and stuff like that. Technically, yeah, I mean, that is one way. But instead, my preference is for every single company, country and culture to have their own models and be able to create their own. And then, like I said, then it becomes acknowledged what it looks like. But then you can set standards. You can be the standard that people build around and then you can incorporate authentication in that standard. Because the other way that I talk about these things, it's a generative search engine. Because now that you have stable diffusion and in six months, it will be perfect photorealistic, 12 months maximum. Do you need Google image search anymore? Because what's your job to be done when you do Google image search? It's to have a picture of a certain type. Now a little freaking two gigabyte file on your local computer or something that you pay a fraction of a penny for online can create any image you can imagine. And you can edit it with your words, basically. What is that if not a search engine of a type? It searches for a concept and it turns it into an image. It's a creative search engine. It creates by, yeah. as you say, you just put in a word or a vo vocal command and say, I want this, and it creates it. But then, but then you can also say, I want a presentation about cicada migrations affecting sesame seed prices. I watch too much Silicon Valley here. Uh, <laughs> and in a couple of years, it will create a beautiful presentation for you. And then you can say, I want it to be happier or sadder, or I want it to be more impactful. And it will adjust the presentation dynamically for you. No more PowerPoint. But it's going to do video as well, right? We don't need to do this. Yes. I could just say, hey, have a conversation between Raoul and Emad about AI, and here's the narrative arc. And it'll just do it. Pretty much, yeah. Yep, just like it does with Steve Jobs, but in 3D video. So, like, uh, I don't know if I should be talking about this, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. Well, I still want to get in trouble. Um, there are two... Well, I'll, I'll, I'll hedge it. There are two boxing legends, families, who are giving us all of the 
motion capture data and media from their lives. And we're building up an analysis of how that works so that we can basically say who won between X and Y in a fight in their prime run on the supercomputer when nobody knows the outcome in full resolution. When they never HD. fought with each other because they were of different generations. Yes. So you can pick two you can pick two different people. I can't say who they are. But you know, those That's types true. of things that you've always postulated. We can do that and, now. And and obviously this is going to completely change music as well, right? Yeah, so we've released our music models already, uh, Dance Diffusion, where we did a slightly different thing. We wanted to take a snapshot of the internet. We made it so everyone can create, take their back catalogue, incorporate it into a kindergarten level of knowledge. We decided not to go to primary school <laughs> for the model. And then you can query that to create your own style in anything. So we call it Dance Diffusion. And we're teaming up with the top EDM DJs and others in the world so that every musician will have their own models that can generate music in their style. And then, if they give permission, we're going to mash them all together, and you've got a generative Spotify, uh, effectively, which then, basically, as people prompt it, there's an attribution system where it pays them. And that will just be like 100 gigabytes as a file that will capture the music of the world, which, again, is insane. This compression thing, you know, it's actually like, you know, you read so much, right, Raoul? And then you write your notes, and then you write your investment thesis. Investment thesis is compression of, of knowledge. A vaccine schedule is compression of knowledge. We finally figured out how to make computers compress information into knowledge. I, I mean, this is... I knew this was going to be an interesting conversation, and I've been looking at this for a while, but frankly, I'm fucking staggered at how fast this is moving yeah. and what you're doing. I mean, it is... I mean, this is truly exponential. As you say, within two or three years, this is multiple billion people and a complete shift on a humanity level of how information is processed and delivered. And that is society. So basically, it's a shift in society. Correct. And so my thing was to go into emerging markets and others and give this technology to them. Otherwise, they'll be left behind because, you know, like DALI 2, you can't use if you're in Ukrainian and you can't use it for anything Ukrainian related. And there's no appealing that or anything like that, you know? But it means Ukrainians are left behind, whereas everyone else can become digitally augmented creatives that can generate an image in eight seconds. So this is also why it's stability. We do everything. We do code models, image models, language models, audio models, video models, protein folding models, and others. And so you're going to see leaps across all these areas in parallel. I mean, I, I've argued for a very long time. In fact, I was writing articles in GMI about this 10 years ago, that AI plus big data equals medical breakthroughs because yeah. what the AI can do with that data is something that humans can't do in the standard scientific method of hypothesis testing. It's just too slow and too cumbersome. You can get it to generate null hypotheses, which humans don't like to do. You know, you can use this to transform so many things once it gets productized. Because that's the other thing. Most of this stuff was stuck in labs. It wasn't productized. So if you look at what's happened with Stable Diffusion, people have built hundreds of products on this ecosystem already. Like make your own sneakers, put yourself into any movie. You know, they've done architecture. They've done 3D worlds. Like the Cambrian explosion of talent is similar to what I've seen at the early days of Web3, except for there's no reason to bootstrap economic incentives when you're creating value. A lot of value in the world, to be honest, is the entropy of information. How much value in the world is taken by taking unstructured data and making it structured? That's exactly what this technology enables anyone to do. And so the future must be that we have AI that works with us to structure the world around us to enable us to achieve more. That's kind of my theory here. And this is, again, why, like I said, it needs to be this person diverse. So you would err towards augman augmented humanity as opposed to a singularity? Or is it augmented yeah. and then a singularity? Where does this go? So look, um, I find the whole AGI thing largely distasteful for a variety of reasons. I think it misaligns a lot of incentives. And I think the current way that <clears throat> a lot of these big labs are going, which is that you take the data and you create gigantic models that are only usable by gigantic machines, will probably kill us all if it creates a singularity. Because the incentive alignment of these groups is to serve us ads and manipulate us effectively. And it's trained on largely Western data sets. 
you know what happens when you like there was this thing lisa the chat bot from um was it lisa no tay the chat bot from microsoft you remember that so it was a chat bot they put on twitter because it became abusive it became a nazi <laughs> so it talked to people and learned from them within a day and a half it turned them into a nazi you know like if i train on the internet i'm going to create a really fucked up ai to put it quite honestly right it's not going to be an ai that loves it's going to be an ai that probably freaking kills us all Whereas if everyone's got their own AIs, and this came before your thing, like, does the network learn? If we take the models of all of humanity and all the cultures and all the different ethical views and we combine those models, and all these AIs are designed to augment humanity rather than manipulate them, I think that's a far more positive potential. I don't think it's sufficient. I think a lot of work needs to be done around this. This AI is dangerous, but it's inevitable. And the way that it's being controlled by private corporations, again, you know, I'm a capitalist. You know, I'm going to build a trillion dollar company to help 10 billion people or whatever. But I think the current mechanism is wrong. And I think, again, there's a lot of things around the singularity thing that are misaligned. If we do build singularity, I would like it to help us all. But in the meantime, let's just help people. Like, let's make people more creative. Let's make people able to access yeah, information. Yeah, but there is unintended like consequences. You get that, right? There are very unintended consequences. We have no idea what the probabilistic outcome is of this. This is decision-making under uncertainty, not risk, right? So this is why the default for all of the corporations is this technology should not be released to anyone because we're the only ones responsible for this technology. And that in itself doesn't they regret stand up to scrutiny. And that doesn't stand up to scrutiny. Both, uh, e th there's different outcomes from different methodology, giving it to everybody. Who knows what foreign governments do with it? You know, there's a lot here. The other thing well, I can tell you on that one, foreign governments already have access to this technology. So Russia and other China and other places ramped up their supercomputers massively. So they already have access to far more advanced versions of this technology than the one that's being made widely available, which is one of the reasons we need to build up our immunity ahead of the next election cycle. So you think that the, the, the let's use the Russian example, the Russian online misinformation campaign is now being run by AI, which is why it's pretty much un unstoppable. The bots it's, and everything it's stoppable else. if you if you build better AI. I mean, to be honest, you like Twitter and things like that. Like, come on, man, you can do better than that. Like, you see all the check mark hijacking and things like that. You can tell what an AI is if you've got sufficiently advanced AI on the other side. But again, people learn to not trust everything they see until we introduce the new structure. Like, we right now need to have a verification protocol for information. Our social media and our information systems are inadequate to the task. Uh, the internet is, a, you know, I think it was Max Clifford from EF that said this, it's an intelligence amplifier, but only for the few. So what happened is the internet took it, compressed it down, and then some people just went way out there, and they have disproportionate impact upon everyone, and most people are left behind. They have the audiences, they set the narrative, and the narrative that basically is most appealing to the Malonian part of our brain is one of divisiveness, which is why the middle has disappeared. And that's why it can tap into these things. That's right. Exactly right. Because, you know, the easiest way to manipulate humans is emotion, and the strongest emotions are the polarizing emotions. Whereas with this technology, you can say, I want this article written from the perspective of a Tea Party conservative versus a libertarian, and I will automatically change that. It's a universal translation engine as well. Again, which is crazy. Clearly, clearly yeah. Yeah, without question. So, okay, yeah. once we've got this technology... We've got another super trend that's happening at the same time. Obviously, there's a few super trends all happening. I call them the exponential age. One of them is compute power, all of this, yeah. right? So they all go together. The other one is robotics. So now, how close are we to creating sentient robots? Where is sentient in this process? What's the definition of sentient, Ralph? I don't know. That's the question. We don't know, right? Nobody knows what sentience is. There is no commonly defined thing. Um, in terms of like the things you see in the movies, nobody knows because this is the thing. If you ask anyone how far away are we from the singularity or intelligence, um, people will say at most, at minimum, 18 months, right? Um, what is it? Why? Because what possible information could you have to say that a human level of intelligence is less than 12 months away? I'm not sure. And nobody's been able to tell me an answer. So, you know, this is a case of we don't know. But what we do know is that AI is getting better than humans at certain things. 
So like OpenAI just released, maybe they were pressured by someone, the open source version of the software called Whisper, which is a dynamic transcription engine. You can speak in five different languages in the same sentence, and it will transcribe it perfectly into English. It's actually got above human level transcription quality. And so stable diffusion is above human level image generation quality. GPT-3 is above human level writing quality. When we combine those all together, you will get an illusion of sentience because you can't tell it's not a human, maybe. But is it really sentient and has agency? I don't know. And for the robotics thing, I think that Tesla's got some much bigger plans than they're letting on in regards to that. And you're going to see some big speed ups. Yeah. I th- again, I think people people are underestimating the speed of what is happening. And I think you've confirmed it to me that the speed of which all of this is happening is is ridiculous. It's a, it's a true exponential. This is also actually when you look at AI research papers, it's a doubling every 24 months on that. So it actually is an exponential thing on AI research papers when you plot it. On a log graph, it's a straight line. So as this goes, it will continue going exponential. And like I said, exponentials are a hell of a thing. We are not equipped to handle them. No, and we've got too many, ge- well, too many. We're going to have the fastest pace of change humanity's ever seen because of technology, because there's so many of these all happening at the same time. It's, it's a e- lot. Even as everything else breaks down, all our systems are at the edge. That's why I called it stability, because I was like, we need to reform education, healthcare, and all these things quick. Because yeah, really we're going to see what we're having. This is not normal, what we're seeing today. You know, like they might say, oh, interest rates are 7%. What worse that could happen? Come on, guys. Like these are symptoms, not kind of causes. The reality is our systems are outdated and need to be improved. So what happened with crypto is they tried to create a whole new system. And then there's this system. And the interface is where all the money is made and lost. Whereas this technology, because it can take unstructured data to structured data, can sit in our systems and extend them. It can disrupt them or it can extend them. So it's really interesting. I think, again, the pace of change will be ridiculous. So how the hell would somebody like Real Vision deal with... I mean, every company on the world, in the world, has to change their business models yet again. People are changing to Web3 because that's another new business model. But here we've got the application of technology at scale in a totally disruptive way. How the hell do we all deal with it? How do we even get ahead? So the lovely thing is that, you know, when I go into the biggest media companies in the world right now, they've already prototyped the technology internally because we made it so they could. This is a new internet that's coming. And so the reason I set up stability was to be the layer one for next generation AI. So my aim is to build the biggest company in the world that puts this technology to everyone so they can build their own models. Or if they want the white glove service, they come to us and we forward deploy engineers to take all the content in the world and make a living and interactive. Um, but you just kind of got to get into this. And again, you know how, you remember how it was when you sent your first Bitcoin? You know, it's magic. Sufficiently advanced technology is magic. This is the same. When you create your first image, like if you do something boring, it's going to be like whatever, right? It's style transfer. But when you create your first original image, combining different styles and concepts and the image in your head becomes reality. You're like, this is new. This is different. This is crazy. It's the biggest thing of all time, and it's not just for images. Images are the breakthrough wedge yeah. because it's gone from 20% to 80%. Language, GPT-3, was an 80% to 90% moment. This is 99% of the world don't believe they can create. They can suddenly create anything. You've got to just get in there, and you've got to basically find where it is because what happens is that Clayton Christensen had this wonderful description of infrastructure as the most efficient means by which a society stores and distributes value. The value landscape in content in enterprise, in a lot of things, in information is about to be upended. And we don't know what the new landscape is. And so you've got to be in there to understand that. What role do humans play? Um, You know, obviously, we've got a shrinking world population over time. So I think of robots and AI as demographics. And I wrote a few articles about it. So these these are new demographics, but they can proliferate very fast. So does that include increased GDP growth and humans need to move towards some sort of universal basic income or different roles? How are you thinking that? I think that we need to move towards universal basic income. Like, uh, you know, this is why I'm rolling this out in emerging markets. The education tablets create the best data sets to feed models for every nation. 
So I'm going to make it so that Malawi adds percentage points to its GDP. Ethiopia adds percentage points to their GDP. India is the number one market for this because they have Altar, India stack, 5G, and all the capital where? needed. So India is one of our biggest markets by far, and literally we will accelerate Indian GDP, and the Indians will then have a better system than we have in the West. Like already, 13 months to literacy and numeracy on one hour a day is better than most primary you know, kindergartens, right? So think about what it's going to be when it's a self-learning AI system. It's going to be crazy. But then they are equipped for that, and you need to have things like UBI. So one of the things we've done is in our country-level subsidiaries, and we're doing just about all the countries in the world, 10% of the shares are reserved for the kids that use our education tablets. So they'll be getting shares um, as they kind of grow. And then we're trying to figure out how UBI looks like on the back of that, which is insane. Like, we shouldn't have to do that. But nobody else is thinking about the pace of change and scale of this, uh, which is why so cool people are doing So are you going to structure this as a DAO or a foundation or something? I wanted to do a DAO of DAOs originally. And then I realized the infrastructure wasn't there. And then I realized, let's just IPO in every single country and create the next trillion dollar business. That's the best way to do this. Uh, by distributed, LCD metrics. distributed listing. Okay, interesting. Yeah, distributed listing. The Indian version of stability should be owned by the Indians for the Indians. We're the smartest Indians running it. And there's an opportunity here. You know, same for all these other countries. Maybe DAOs work in the future. Maybe you can do airdrops. It's open, right? But this is a cool thing. This technology has an exponential. So who knows? Nobody knows what the answer is. Final question, because there's a lot to digest here. How are governments going to deal with this? So West, the European Union is trying to ban open source artificial intelligence now because they view the edges regulation. So authors of models will be liable for the use of the models. The US is uncertain right now. The UK is massively pro-AI, and so they've been upgrading it massively. Uh, in emerging markets, guess what? I'm going to the governments that are telling them they can have this technology for free. They love me. So <laughs> you'll have most of the world loving it, and then Europe is a big question mark. Uh, US is a small question mark, and I think they'll be very pro this because it adds GDP at a time when there is no abundance. Like The question is, does it then collapse yeah. GDP afterwards? Politicians don't think that far, honestly. No, when, you know? when I look at it, you know, what is G GDP? GDP is population growth plus productivity. This does both yes. po population growth and productivity because it is population, right? De robots and AI are demographics and it increases productivity. So that should mean the pie increases. So per capita GDP rises. That's my working hypothesis until it replaces the humans yeah. eventually anyway. <laughs> Exactly. And then there's this other part, which is that basically the West and advanced economies have borrowed too much from their balance sheet from the future based on identity. Whereas Correct. you look at India and other places, they haven't done that. So when you incorporate this technology with good identity structures, you suddenly have massive credit creation like you've never seen before. Because information, which is money, can flow much nicer around India or freaking Ethiopia or anywhere else. Especially because our tablets are standardized tablets that we're deploying at scale with a new type of bond whereby you only pay based on outcomes if you're a donor, which is measured through the tablets. So my thing is like infrastructure uplift for those countries. The West, I have no idea what to do with. Like I'm just going to the companies and say, give me your content and let's share in this upside. Um, but it's difficult to try and fix the UK or US or Europe, and there's enough smart people there who can do that. Hey man, amazing conversation. I've absolutely loved it. I'm terrified and excited at the same time, which is what I was hoping. <laughs> I'll definitely get you back to talk more about this because we barely scratched the surface. Yeah, no problem. Like I said, we've kind of not talked about it publicly. I think this is one of the first times we're talking about actually the bigger plans. Like I think uh, we're recording this now. Next week we do our big launch event. But everyone needs to know about this, right? And everyone needs to participate because this should be a communal effort because we need to guide it together, right? Exactly right. Well, listen, best of luck with everything. Let's hope the unintended consequences are not as bad as could be. We'll only find out, but we're going down this path anyway, regardless. So you might as well give it to the masses and not to the few. Exactly. Cheers, Raul. Thank you, my friend. There is so much to unpack from an interview like this. Firstly, it shows that the hypothesis 
that technological growth is going exponential and it is not going to stop regardless of what the central banks are doing or inflation's doing. It's kind of irrelevant when the speed of technolog technological adoption is so rapid and so truly extraordinary and profound. The ways which this is changing humanity, both from education, medical sciences, science in general, the creative industries, the media industry, everybody. This is, again, happening on a scale like the internet, but maybe even more so. And we've got many of these technologies all overlapping. As I've talked about before, blockchain technology has been the fastest adoption of any technology the world has ever seen, and looks like AI may even exceed that. And then we've got robotics and space and Internet of Things and on and on and on. So you can either fear this stuff or you can use it to your advantage and invest in your own future. And that's the route I take. There is unintended consequences. We just don't know what they are. And I think Emad's point about should it be given to the few or the many to deal with those unintended consequences? I think he's probably right that give it to everybody is probably the only way around this. Anyway, a truly extraordinary interview and I hope you enjoyed it. We hope you enjoyed the video. At Real Vision, we help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy with in-depth analysis from real experts. Join the revolution at realvision.com.